Okay, great. So, hello, everybody. Thank you all for being here for this first section. So, I am Hernani de Freitas Martins. I am a postdoctoral researcher in the ISM2 here in Spain. So, I'm going to uh, give you this tutorial on molecular dynamics using Siesta. It is based on the previous presentations from Emilio and Marivy, and this can be also found in the Siesta web page. So the idea is that I will be presenting to you uh, what you will do in the tutorial, and then after that you go to the hands-on section, and then you go back here for me to show uh, uh, some uh, of the outputs you can obtain. So this is how the economy will work. I will start by introducing a single concept, the potential energy surface, and then I will present some of the molecular dynamics algorithms that are available in Siesta. And after that, I present a lot of extra stuff, which is basically how to use constraints, how to do continuations, how to control some of the output data, post-processing and visualization, all related to molecular dynamics. So um, the potential energy surface is a concept that is important to introduce because it is uh, used both in joint optimization and molecular dynamics. So here I want to show you the differences between the two cases. So here you have reaction coordinates and in the vertical axis you have the energies and some important points are highlighted here. For example, the minimum for reactants, the saddle points. So if you do jump optimizations, what we do here is to move, for example, from a minimum of a reactant here, we pass through this uh, transition state here, which is a saddle point, and then we reach the minimum for the product. We could follow another path in the potential energy surface. For example, this one highlighted in red, where we start from the same point here, we pass through this other saddle point and we reach a different minimum. So this is what we do in joint optimization. So we move on the potential energy surface. So we follow certain paths. And in that sense, we search for local or global minima. What is the difference between this and doing molecular dynamics? When you do molecular dynamics instead, you visit several points in the potential energy surface and we aim at visiting as much as possible points. So we move over the potential energy surface and that means we need to do sampling. So that's what we do with molecular dynamics. Uh, Emilio presented to you yesterday and you probably have heard about this in the other DFT codes you learned during this school that uh, here we have a problem of moving a uh, uh, we have a many body problem of moving the atoms and to do this we use the adiabatic decoupling because the mass of uh, the electrons compared to the nuclei uh, is uh, is very small and in that sense we move just the nuclei separated and the electrons will accommodate to the new positions but to move the atoms we need to compute the forces and then we move the atoms in the direction of these forces we compute and to do so in the siesta code this is a theorem that is used i'm not going to go into into details here but in the presentation in the siesta web page you can find some more details so the main thing is we need to compute forces here so how the molecular dynamics algorithms work in siesta here i brought uh four examples but there are much many options other options in the siesta manual so here i brought the case of the nve ensemble which is the verlet algorithm the nvt which is the nose the anil which is you can increase you can need the temperature or the pressure and the nose pahinello hama which is the npt so what is the cycle in a molecular dynamics calculation? You will start by providing the code with some initial coordinates and forces. Then it will do the molecular dynamics step. After that, you will obtain new coordinates. And over these new coordinates, you need to compute the forces. Once you obtain the new forces, you get coordinates again, and you repeat this over and over until you finish the molecular dynamics. What is the difference between this uh, thing here and the classical molecular dynamics, for example? It's basically this part here. In the case of Siesta or DFT codes in general, what we call ab initio molecular dynamics, we compute the forces using quantum mechanics. If we do this with classical molecular dynamics, we compute the forces using force fields. So, what are the changes that need to be done in the input of siesta to run molecular dynamics compared to the stuff you learned yesterday so you first 
of all, you, you need to change the type of run. So you should choose the, the molecular dynamics algorithm, Verly, knows one of those I presented in the previous slide. You need to set the initial time step. In this case here, it's going to be one. You also need to step the final time step. So that means 100 uh, time steps will be covered here. And this is uh, the, the time the time step length. So one femtosecond in this case. So that means that one, one femtosecond for each MD step. In total, we would have 100 femtoseconds of simulation here. And you, can, you should also uh, define the temperature and the pressure if this is the case. So in this case, here's the target temperature. So it will equilibrate the system until you have variations around the 300 Kelvin in this example. So those are some of the things that must be defined to run molecular dynamics. So going to the uh, extra stuff. So when running molecular dynamics, there is a thing that's very common that is the use of constraints. For example, here where we have a metallic slab, this is copper. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six layers of copper. And then you have a vacuum here. So oftentimes we need to freeze these atoms, this, in this case, the four uh, bottom layers. Then we keep those atoms in the coordinates of its uh, crystalline structure. And we allow only the purple ones to move, which are the ones next to the vacuum or the ones in which we will attach something, for example, molecules or put liquid water and this stuff. So by constraining these atoms and keeping these atoms here moving, you need to add some extra things in the input. You can, for example, add this block here and constrain every single copper atom that would be all atoms would be orange ones here, not purple. Or you can do this thing here. You can freeze the atoms from 1 to 48, and then all atoms that doesn't have that index will be moving. This is the case of this picture here. So this is something that's important to know that is possible to be done. So uh, continuations. You will see in the, in the tutorial an example of continuation. So to do this, first of all, we need to make sure that files will be read. So that means you save XV. XV is the file that stores the coordinates and the velocities. If this is set to true, that means that Siesta will try to read this information. So it will try to look for these files in the folder you're running the calculations. What you need to put in the input file besides that? So you can uh, uh, you can put, uh, sorry, what files can be read? So the XV, which is velocity and coordinates, and this one here, the system label dot X restart is the restart for the ensemble. Let's say you're using NVT, so this is gonna be the name of ensemble dot the name of the system label dot the name of the ensemble underscore restart. So that means you will be continuing the molecular dynamics from the exact same point you stopped before. You can also do that manually by, for example, copying and paste manually the final coordinates. But if this is a molecular dynamic, then it's not really a continuation because if you don't provide initial velocities, they are going to be computed. So, but that's also possible. And these files here, system label dot ANI and MDE, so those files are updated. Uh, so if you provide this in the continuation, the new data for the trajectory in ANI and for the energy and temperature will be written in the in the bottom of this file. So it isn't something that is accumulated in this file. So uh, controlling output data, not everything is printed by the full siesta. So if you want to uh, run like production runs, you need to think in advance what you want to do as post-processing. Then you save the files you will need. For example, here you can save the nucleon populations. You can save the partial charts at every geometry step in the molecular dynamics. So you, you must set this to true. Of course, it will generate a lot of uh, megabytes of file because the files to generate will be enormous. But if you want to evaluate this in every geometry step, you need to set up this to true. This is to save the electrostatic potential, to save the total potential, and to write the coordinate steps. So Keep in mind that not everything is printed by default. Uh, how to do post-processing? So after your calculations 
are finished, how you post process data. So there are some files in the case of molecular dynamics that are um, files that you can post process. The main one I would say is the .mde. Here you have the temperature and the energy stored for each uh, molecular dynamics step. So you can, for example, plot how energy evolves or how the temperature evolves along the simulation time. And also in the main output file, which is the system label dot out, here you have a lot of information that's printed. And then you can use grab command to grab information there and then post process it. Uh, you can plot this directly in the terminal, especially because it's a tutorial, so you can run everything inside the supercomputer, Leonardo. So to do so, you will find this script here in the same folder that you can cope the tutorial files. This is a simple script that uses GNU plot to plot data directly on the terminal. So it is a fast way to, to check it. So if you if you run this command, you, you need to provide the full the full path for it, the place you 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 store it in your home. And then you put the after that you put the name of the file and then the, the columns you want to plot. So this is gonna plot in the MD file the column one and two. In this case, it will be the time step and the temperature. So if you do that, you understand in your terminal how this is working. Another way of doing this is by combining this with a grab command. For example, you can do a grab in the in the output file. There is a mistake here, sorry. It should be grab the 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 keyword and then the file. So, for example, the output file that will print in the terminal the the grab result. And to plot this, instead of putting name of file, you put this thing between quotes and you select the columns. It will plot the same way. You can play with this and uh, plot some data from the output. And if you want to define some ranges, you can also put like column one, column two, and plot from, mm -hmm. from time step five to time step one. So this is something you can also play with. So the acceptable is this one here that Federico uh, added uh, in the in the folder of this tutorial. So you can cope from there. So it, it should look something like this. So in this case here, I am plotting the, the energy as a function of the time step for a, a given calculation. So it will print this thing on your terminal. So it's like a, just a way of uh, quickly checking it. You can, of course, download the data and plot it in, in, in any code you prefer in your own computer. This is a way you can plot directly on the supercomputer. So I am approaching the end of this. So how to visualize trajectory? So it's an important thing here because you want to see nice videos and nice trajectories. And also it's important to see uh, how the if the molecular dynamics is working correctly. So in this case, you need to download some files and you can visualize using, for example, VMD. This is the one I recommend, but there are other options. So the files that can be read are the .ani. This is an XYZ file for each molecular dynamics step. Or you can read this file here, which is a single structure, is a static structure that mm -hmm. is the last one from the calculation. But this needs some uh, post-process before. So you can use, for example, the ASE that probably Leonardo, you have it. Or if you if you want to install in your in your Linux local computer, is a via sudo pt-get, you can install it. So you can convert this file into a PDB file, and then you can read it with VMD directly. If you want to read the .ani, you need to add this flag here, minus XYZ, to tell VMD that this is a XYZ file. So this is how you visualize. So that's basically a general overview of uh, the kind of things we're going to do. So in this path here, and you have this information on the website as well, you have this tutorial, Molecular Dynamics. So there are many things there that could be done. So I encourage you to try to do all of it, but you can also skip some and go to the one that interests you most. So just to, oops, just to show you, um, to remind you, so here you can put questions by editing this here. And this is the page for the tutorial. So uh, you have, for example, doing an NV calculation. Then after that, you have the NVT, 
So it's important for you to do both and to see the differences between them. Then you have the N, uh, uh, NPE case here. After that, you have a case of using molecular dynamics to do jumped uh, relaxations. So that is a possibility as well. So it, it is a molecular dynamics in the end. And then you have annealing for the silicon structure interacting with a hydrogen uh, molecule. And this is probably the most interesting one. And inside those, you have some hints and some extra stuff to do, change some parameters. So now it's time to go there and try to, 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 to do the tutorial. And if you have any doubts about this presentation, you can ask now, I think. Uh, or you can ask questions on the fly about the tutorial. So the, the tutors are here to help you if you need. That's all. So uh, by this time, you probably had time to go to explore a lot of these tutorials there, a lot of the options there. So you have you can also continue this later if you want, if you could not finish. Uh, and I will bring here to you two examples of things that could be evaluated. But Federico, he wrote uh, the, the the explanations on, in the tutorial web page, so it, it's very well explained, and uh, the expected results are all described there. So for this case here, for example, if you compare the energy as a function of the time step for the case with the NVE ensemble, in this case in the in the left is not printed, but it is the NVT. So here we can we keep the the number of particles, the volume, and the energy constant. And here in the left, in this case, the number of particles, volume, and temperature. So if you compare the, the, the two plots, you can see that in the right case, the energy fluctuates around the initial value, so it's been conserved. Here, it's not the case because it decreases and then it starts to equilibrate. So those are the two possibilities. This is pretty much the same in any molecular dynamics code, uh, either classical uh, MD or quantum MD. And then the next one, this is an interesting one that is an extra uh, task from the last tutorial. In this part here, you are supposed to read the .xb file. And if you enter in the .xb file, you will see that not all the velocities are zero there. Some of the velocities for some atoms are non-zero. Then in the very beginning, we force a given movement. And indeed, if you check here, in the very beginning of the MD, the H2 molecule, it goes approaching the surface and then this molecule, it, it gets bound and it is uh, split and it gets bound to the surface. And if you check this along the MD, you can plot, for example, the energy. You can see that the energy decreases. If you keep running this, this would equilibrate at a certain point. Sorry, this is the temperature and this is the energy. So in both cases, if you keep running, it should equilibrate at some point. So this is a case where you kind of uh, force a situation you wanna you know that's gonna occur so you can do this kind of sim of uh, molecular dynamics as well okay <clears throat> good morning everyone um i'm going to i'm going to give a, a brief introduction of uh, analysis tools that are available in siesta um and uh, I'm going to cover in the presentation more things that than uh, than we are going to do in the exercise, but I think it's uh, it, it will be useful for 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 many of you, uh, especially if you want to plot things that are not uh, density of states or or bands. Uh, so there are many other options to analyze in a, uh, in 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 Siesta and generally in DFT. Uh, okay, so the first thing is the is the charts analysis. And if, if you remember what uh, what we discussed yesterday about the electronic density and the basis expansion and how you can write the the, the wave functions using some uh, some coefficients and some basis orbitals, the the number of electrons that you have in your system is basically the sum of your occupied states, and this can be basically written in terms of uh, the product, the trace of the product of the density matrix and the overlap. And now, if you if you think that this sum on, on electronic states uh, and uh, sorry, and electronic orbitals can be decomposed on sums on uh, uh, different orbitals that you have in your in your system in your atoms, you can directly access to uh, some way of localizing your your charge and assigning electrons 
to to an atom. So you 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 decompose this this sum on orbitals on some atomic or, uh, atoms and orbitals that belong to the atoms, and that allows you to define what is the the Mulliken population of of a particular atom. And you can access uh, also what is a specific population of one shell of uh, uh, of uh, electrons in your atoms and, 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 and distinguish between the different uh, contributions. And, and that's basically controlled with an input in the FDF file, which is called the, the, the right Mulliken population that can have several values. And depending on, on what is the level uh, that you use, you have more information in the output and you can analyze all these things. The, the specific details of the of uh, of these indexes you can find that in the in the tutorial. By default, it's not going to print any uh, Mulliken population, and I, I encourage you to try uh, just to 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 use the the, the one here that will pl plot what is the atomic population on uh, on on your system. Okay. But there are other ways of uh, of uh, assigning charts to to atoms. One geometric uh, form is is to is to use the Voronoi volume around your atom. So that's basically the, the shortest distance that you have between between atoms. You can define this geometrically, and essentially what you do is you integrate the uh, electronic charge uh, in the in the mesh uh, in the volume around your atom. Uh, there is another approach which is the Hirschfeld charge. Which basically has into account also some some uh, some uh, some uh, uh, um, normalization that that uh, that comes from the from the atomic isolated atomic charge, and in general these two approaches to to assign the charges are less sensitive to the basis to to how you choose the basis. The, the Mulliken charges are very sensitive to to the quality of your basis and 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 they are very um, uh, variable. Uh, this in general gives uh, results that are um, more consistent. Uh, and, and, and to to write these things in the in the output of CS, that you just have to to to, to put a couple of labels in the input. So um, and, and this is relatively cheap to to compute. Okay, more things now that we are talking about doing things in the in the mesh. The other things that you can do is plot the charge density or or the potentials on the grid on the real space grid that that uh, that. That Siesta uses to compute some of the matrix elements. What kind of things you can plot? For example, the the total uh, electronic density, <clears throat> the deformation charge that you have, which is the difference between the self-consistent uh, charge, so the the, the the constant charge, and the charge of uh, uh, isolated atoms that are placed in, on the on the same positions. You can plot also the total potential or the formation potential. So you can there are different kind of potentials that you can that you can plot. And basically, to to do this, you have to ask Siesta to print a specific file which has these terminations, these labels at the end. So you have system label dot draw if you put these options and so on. And this will pr print uh, files which have all the same format and can be analyzed with the same kind of tools. Okay, so the format is uh, you basically are, are printing the information of these um, uh, uh, these functions on the on the mesh of points that you have in CS. There are more things that you can plot. You can plot uh, uh, the local density of states, which is basically uh, uh, within a certain range of energy. What is the uh, the, the the amount of, uh, of 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 charge that you have? So you have an energy decomposition of the density. And defining the range of energy, you can plot what is the contribution of all your electronic states uh, to the electronic density. And this requires a block where you define uh, the, the the range of energies uh, in which you are going to to do this integral. Okay. Um, another thing that, that that you can plot is the wave function. You can plot the norm of the wave function, or just the 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 real, so the the, the, the complex uh, quantity, including the real and the imaginary. Uh, okay, once you ask uh, uh, CSA to print those files, you have to analyze them, and there are many many th uh, utils available. Uh, if you go to to the CSA distribution in the subdirectory util uh, slash grid, there you have a set of tools that allow to manipulate the, the charges. 
there is also a, a, an option to compute uh, the contour of, uh, of your charge in a, in a one-dimensional line or in a two-dimensional plane. There is another tool that is uh, PLRAW. There is a common, uh, a powerful tool that is called Denchar, and you have a tutorial explaining a little bit how it, how it works. You also have CISL, uh, which is a post-processing Python post-processing tool uh, around Siesta, and I think that uh, maybe you will have some information about this later. Uh, uh, and then there are other contributors uh, to the Siesta ecosystem with different tools to to convert the the the, the raw data from from Siesta into something that can be read, uh, read with other uh, tools. I particularly like this uh, raw to XSF, uh, which uh, is is written is written uh, um, in the format of uh, excrescent uh, uh, file. And now I go and move into some of the tools that that you can that you can use. Probably you have your own uh, choice, but this is just to to those of you that don't know what tools you can use. Uh, one is uh, they are all uh, open source. Xcris then uh, reads the format that I mentioned before, the XSF files. Uh, then you have Vesta, you have Molecule, and uh, GDIS does not plot, plot things in the in the in real space. But I think this is useful because it can read directly the FDF files from CS and then you can uh, manipulate the structures and, and change formats and do this. Uh, okay, and now we move directly to the to the tutorial to the to the hands-on today. Uh, this is basically uh, uh, you are going to plot the, the the band structure and the density of states on graphene nano ribbons, <clears throat> and, and and in the exercise you you will get familiar with a, a, a few things. So for those of you that that don't know anything about the the graphene nano ribbons, uh, th these these are zigzag with hydrogen termination, and uh, and and you have an edge state in the in the in the ribbon, uh, which can be spin polarized. And there are actually two solutions. The ground set is an antiferromagnetic configuration, which you have spins in one side of the uh, of, of, of the ribbon and opposite spins on the other side. Uh, but if you do a calculation uh, in Siesta, um, starting from, from, from scratch, you usually fall into the ferromagnetic configuration, which, has, which is a metallic uh, um, solution and it's slightly higher in energy. The antiferromagnetic solution uh, has a gap and to convert uh, the self-consistency to this solution you have to initialize the system with opposite spins on, the, on both edges. And to do that you have to uh, define a block of the, uh, of the density matrix in which you say that one edge is going to be being polarized positively, and the other edge is going to be uh, has, has, is going to have an opposite spin polarization. Now, in the in the files of the of the of the Hanson, you have um, two subdirectories. One corresponds to a ten zigzag uh, chain uh, graphene ribbon, and the other corresponds to the four zigzag edge. Um, this is just in case you want to run something uh, quick. Uh, because this is uh, this is very fast, but uh, in the supercomputer you will not have any problem in in, in running the, the ten, ten exact nano ribbon. <clears throat> okay, what we are going to to do is is plotting the band structure along the the high symmetry uh, lines. In this particular case, this is a one dimensional problem, so you have vacuum at both uh, edges of the ribbon, but also on top and on, on bottom. You have uh, a lot of vacuum here. <clears throat> Uh, and, but you have periodicity along one line, and, and you are going to plot the band structure uh, along that particular line. Then you can uh, compute the density of state, which is basically adding uh, 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 a small Gaussian around uh, each of the um, uh, eigenenergies that you have, and you can play with the, with the width of, of this Gaussian to represent the, the delta function. And as uh, as uh, we show for the Mulliken charges, you can also do some decomposition of the uh, of uh, of these uh, density of states in contributions from different atoms or from different uh, orbitals. Okay, 
you can do the kinds of, the same kind of uh, of tricks and you can define a projected density of state on a particular orbital and, uh, and another part of the exercise is to show this kind of things so if you look at the density of states of the system you can uh, you can uh, plot the density of states for both spin components uh, but if uh, uh, if you look at the projected density of states and you project on one edge the carbon on one edge or in the other <clears throat> you get a spin signal and you see and you see that the the, the two edges have different uh, speeds so you have the same contribution in, in the electronic density but it's coming from different different uh, places in, in space uh and the last thing that uh, i want to mention is that the same thing that you can do with the density with the density of states and, and the projected density of states you can do also with the <clears throat> with the bands and that is what we call the the, the fat bands so you can uh, define uh, um, a wave <clears throat> on the on the band structure on a particular um, orbitals or a particular set, set of orbitals or a particular atom and do a projection so by plotting the, the 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 bands with a thickness that depends on on what is the weight of the contribution of one particular atom and with that you you, you know exactly what is the contribution in the in the band structure of the different orbitals <clears throat> okay <clears throat> my voice is running out um we have uh the files in uh, uh in in the in the, in the same directory as as uh, uh, as the previous exercise and you have to go to the zero two analysis and you have to follow the, the instructions that are in the web page <clears throat> now there is a there is a file that is that is missing in the in the distribution uh in this in this directory um and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to 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 upload everything into the into into yeah, the scene. it's so it's already there I already already there okay so there is there is a, a file that was missing uh, this morning which is uh, p dos dot npr um which is basically this this block that is in the uh, in, in the tutorial okay if you don't find it just uh, ask and and we'll, I, I will answer what is uh, what is what you need Yes, hello, uh, I'm Nick. I am from uh, the Technical University of Denmark and uh, I will present some features in Siesta. Um, so this session will be a little bit different from what you have experienced previously. Uh, earlier today and yesterday, there will be no tutorials related to this. So this will just give you some basic idea of uh, what else you can do in Siesta or, or with Siesta. Um, so the first thing uh, that uh, won't be cover, covered in this tutorial is, is, this, is the spin orbit coupling. So this is fully implemented in Siesta and uh, it can allow you to investigate topological insulators or other interesting systems where spin orbit coupling is, uh, is important. So it allows uh, fully relativistic calculations. Um, it of course doubles or quadruples your your matrices because you now both have uh, spin up and down, but you also have the off diagonal uh, up down components, as you can see uh, in the in the Hamiltonian uh, box right here to to the right. So this means that your diagonalization of the matrices when extracting the uh, wave functions will be uh, more heavy. Um, Generally, the spin orbit contribution to the total energy is very small. It's in the range of milli electron volts. So it also means that you need to be extremely careful about your calculations. Um, you might be used to some uh, settings for a system, um, but as soon as you add spin orbit coupling, you really need to reconverge everything. What you can calculate from spin orbit coupling is uh, the so-called magnetic anisotropies, uh, MCA values, uh, to see how the energy landscape looks as you rotate your spin configuration. Uh, you can also look at spin textures in the Bruin zone or, or other details uh, related to this. Also project the density of states um, for the spin orbit coupling cases. Uh, the spin orbit coupling comes in two variants. There's an offside method which is the default one, and generally you should really use this one. There's also an on-site method where you are only taking into account spin-orbit coupling on 
uh, on atoms, so in between orbitals. Um, this is not the default, and uh, you should be careful if you're using this. At least you should understand your system, whether or not the, uh, the physics here is applicable. So there's a, a DOI here you can see for, for when you should be careful about using the uh, on-site method. There's not too much. There's a, there's a small overhead in using the off-site method, but generally I would, I would just advise you to, to stick with the off-site. So as I, I write down here, there's a requirement that uh, goes a little bit further than, uh, than what you have discussed. So you've already discussed the sort of potentials and the basis sets. Uh, you had a talk yesterday related to the basis set. And here you really need to be very careful about your basis sets and, um, and the sort of potentials. Uh, so you need to reconvert your basis sets. You also need to have them in the fully relativistic form. But uh, generally, you can easily get those from uh, the ASM program or from the sort of dojo side or whatever you prefer. Generally, you really need a, a much uh, larger precision in the grid. So a higher mesh cutoff is, is really advised. You need to converge this parameter as well. Uh, also, K points tends to be more important. So you need to, to, con to add more K points generally. And uh, SCF convergence uh, may be more difficult. Consider that you now have both spin up and down, and you also have the off diagonal elements on that. So you have more degrees of freedom. That tends to make uh, SCF cycles much more harder to converge. So if you are going to study spin orbit, really be careful. Take the time to uh, really understand what's, what's uh, going on in your calculations and be sure that you have converged your, your system parameters. Uh, it's, it's very important. There's also some tutorials related to the spin orbit, uh, as far as I recall, on, on the tutorial site that you have already been using. So here, um, just to expand a little bit on this, with spin orbit coupling, the, the components are mixed, so you can't really define anything that's spin up or down. So you, you have a vector of spin that can be oriented anywhere in the space. Um, as we've just saw, uh, saw in the analysis, um, you, you can initialize spins for different configurations of your spin system. And here, uh, in this case, for instance, uh, you would say that our atom 5 has a negative spin component or a spin value of minus 1, and it's oriented along the, the theta and the psi angles here. So in this case, it's, it's oriented uh, 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 along these axes with these angles. And you can define them, them individually for all of the atoms, um, and that's generally the advised way to do it if you are going to search for the minimum energy landscape or the rotating angle landscape of your system. Uh, an example of that can be shown here to the right, where uh, for two different systems, uh, you can rotate the angles, and then you can see how the energy changes with respect to the angles. So this one is uh, on the scale of electron volts, but uh, you would generally see much uh, weaker um, energy differences. Uh, so this is the theta angle, and here it's the, the phi angle, and here you can see the difference is much, much weaker, right? Um, so another thing, instead of initializing spins um, and redo the entire calculation again and again, one thing you can do with the CISL utility, so it was just mentioned in the previous talk, so here you can read in a density matrix, and then you can rotate the spins, write a new uh, density matrix, and then use that as a restart for your new calculation. That will greatly improve your convergence because you don't have to restart from uh, uh, a non, um, uh, what can you say? Yeah, you have a better initial guess of your density when you, when you do it like this. So also here, the Mulliken and the PDOS, they yields now, uh, an additional set of components because you now have the spin vector, so you both have the total uh, density of states, but you also have a spin vector associated with the atoms or orbitals in that case. And there you can, can see how the spin configuration looks on the individual atoms in your system and see whether you have any uh, configuration space there that's, that's interesting from the, for your studies. Another uh, thing that I find very uh, useful is that you can design your own custom k-point samplings. And as I said, for the spin orbit case, sometimes you are only, it, it requires a much 
higher k-point sampling. But typically, what you find in well, in some systems at least, is that the, there's typically only a small portion of the Bruin zone that's really interesting around the Fermi level. So that that's where the the a lot of the important physics happens is around the Fermi level. And that's what I refer to here as the Fermi physics. So uh, uh, a case point could be the graphene, where you have a k-point, where you have the Dirac cone. And there you could be interested in increasing the k-point sampling to see special physics happening around there. Um, and this is where this custom k-point sampling can be really useful because you can have a coarse density of k-points in the Bruin zone uh, that covers the entire Bruin zone. And then you can zoom in on some specific k-point in the Bruin zone where you will increase your density. And it's not too difficult to use. You just create your input file with your k-points. And here's a small example. This one has four k-points, the, the k-points here, and the weight of the k-point. And that's basically it. Uh, you create it with any tool you want, and then you can uh, use that as your input for, for your SCF parameters. But you can also use it only for the PDOS analysis for a subsequent uh, zoom in on a, on a particular k-point system. So here's a, a small example. Here's a Bruin zone from uh, zero to a half. So here you have time reversal symmetry. We are not going from minus half to, to a half, but only from, from zero to a half. And that's why you see that this point looks a little bit uh, smaller than the other ones. The size of the blobs is the, the weight of the k-points. And then you have from minus half here to, to a half here. So let's say that you are very much interested in only this k-point. You have some interesting physics happening here. And uh, then you can replace that k-point with a, a smaller uh, k-grid and then increase the density of, of k-point sampling uh, around that point. So that can be quite useful. And uh, in often cases, it can also speed up the calculations quite a bit because you don't want to use these small grid points for all of the points that you have here. So this is a, a, a quite easy way to circumvent these problems. Another feature in Siesta um, is, is that you can do charge gates. So you can allow for complicated gates or charge configurations. Um, here's a small example of uh, you have some system here of atoms and you take out some electrons from that. And then you put those electrons you take out from the system and place them somewhere else in your system. So in this case, it's a, it's a plane that covers the entire simulation cell, and uh, that will induce some uh, electric field between these two. Uh, there's a, a variety of possibilities here. You can add spheres. So you can also add a, a particular sphere here. If you have a, chart, a gate with a charge defect, that can also be done. You can create infinite planes like this one. You can create boxes of charges if you are only having a gate that exists somewhere close to some interesting part of your system, or you can have any combination of the above. One thing that you should really be careful about is that you should think about electrostatics in, in, in these cases. So here you have a gate, for instance, and uh, you have also uh, um, um, a removal of charge from this one. So this amounts to being effectively a capacitor. And when you have a capacitor, you have to use dipole corrections in the siesta implementation because of the periodic boundary conditions. So always when you have to do gates or charge gates, or actually any kind of system, if you have some kind of dipole uh, in your system, consider using dipole corrections for, uh, for slab calculations. So here's a case study. Um, you can look at how the, the density, the k-length is for a particular system. In this case, we have graphite. So all of the red, the black dots with red blobs around them, they are carbon atoms, and they are located in a in a layered fashion like this. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten layers of uh, graphene. That's more or less graphite. And then we have 20 angstrom below it, we have a gate plane. So it looks exactly like this one. And then in this case, since it's a dipole uh, you are inducing, we also need to add the dipole corrections. And then you can ex extrapolate what is the density decay for, for the electrons, or how good is it is graphite at screening uh, an electric field. 
and then you can extract some parameters uh, and see how that uh, corresponds to experimental uh, values. So this is the pure uh, siesta calculation. Another thing that can be done is to couple this gate constructs with uh, transiesta. We will I will go a little bit in more in depth with transiesta on the next slides. So here you just have to be really careful about uh, great gate handling around electrodes. That will be more more um, in depth discussed on the next slide. So here it's it's really important that when you're doing a transiesta and gates, you should be careful about the the difference between a gate potential or a gate charge. So the current way it's being done is that you have a gate charge, and that's not a potential. It will induce a potential difference between the, this, the, the different atomic sites and the charge plane, but you have to extract what the potential really looks like from, uh, from that calculation. So you can't really define the potential difference you, you have between your gate and your system. You have to do that in an iterative way. So here, here is a small example where we are doing a graphene nanoconstriction and uh, we have a gate underneath it and then we also apply a bias. And what you can see is that the, char the potential profile pins to one of the edges. It depends on the, uh, the polarity of the bias and the polarity of the gate. But here you see that uh, the potential that you have on, on this electrode up here it crosses all the way down to this intersection here. So you only have a potential difference down here when you apply a bias between these two, uh, two ends. And the reason is that, uh, well, so one thing is, one thing that's uh, important in this case is that you cannot find this pinning of the potential drop without having a gate. Uh, and that's because that you have a, an uneven amount of electrons and holes in the two different sites depending on the gate level and the bias level. Um, so for V equals zero, you have this situation where you have shifted the Dirac cones down. And then when you start applying a bias, you shift your Dirac cones again. And then you see a difference between the number of electrons and the number of holes. And this is what causes the pinning. But if you had no gates, you would have the Dirac cones would be at the Fermi level. And then a shifting would mean that you have an equal uh, number of electrons and equal number of holes. And then you would see a potential drop in the middle of the constriction. So uh, let's go into transiesta. There was a small uh, teaser on the previous slide. Let's just see what time. Yes. So um, transiesta is a, is a way to handle uh, non-equilibrium effects. And it's done by having electrodes in the system. Now, electrodes is probably the most confusing part of the transistor way because they are handled uh, in a separate calculation. So in this case, we have four uh, electrodes here. You can have any number of electrodes, also just one, if you want that in transistor. Um, and uh, so this is across the graphene nanoribbon system. And um, yeah, you can have any number of electrodes and you can also apply different biases between the, the, the different electrodes. Transiesta is, is quite scalable. It can handle uh, several thousands of atoms. I believe this one is around 3,000 atoms or, or is it three three and a half thousand? So it's a pretty big system with four electrodes. And uh, this is to, in this case, it wants to investigate how the current flows between two STM tips uh, on a surface of, of, of this system. And you can see it's 80 angstrom apart. And uh, it's, it's also a quite heavy calculation, I must say, but you, you can do it if, if, you, uh, if you want. There's also in Transiesta an implementation of, called the real space self energies. I'll go a little bit more in depth on that a little bit later. And that allows you to really investigate single defect calculations, which can be quite important for let's say STM systems, but also to just handle what is a, a single defect in a, in a surface or, or in some other system. Yeah, so gates with complex shapes, you can do uh, many things there together with transistor. So some brief um, discussion on what transistor can do. You can calculate systems out of equilibrium. So you can apply potential differences between electrodes. You can calculate energy and uh, K-point result transmission functions in your brain zone. 
You can also calculate density of states and uh, spectral density of states and uh, currents, of course, between electrodes. And then you can also look into uh, orbital transmissions, which uh, corresponds to uh, the, the electron hopping between atomic sites or orbital sites. And in this way, you can see how the current actually is flowing through your system at a bias. It's a little bit harder to do transistor, or let's say much harder to do transistor calculations. First, you have to make sure that the requirements for regular transistor calculation is obeyed. So the pseudo, the basis set, you have to convert the mesh cutoff, uh, K-grids and stuff like that. But then after you have done that, then you also need to uh, be sure of a few things. The first thing is you have to have a bulk and a metallic electrode. So that's a, a really important detail that's important for a user. A metallic electrode is necessary because the, then the Fermi level is well defined. If you have a semiconductor in, as an electrode, your, your Fermi level is ill-defined, or at least it's ill-defined when you couple it into a system where you have a well-defined uh, Fermi level. So, Please do not try to do a semiconductor, or at least you need to really know what you're doing. Um, another really important part is that electro regions in the device should really be screened from the defects that you have in your in your device. That is really important because you are you are attaching an infinite part of the electrode. So let's see here. Oh, oh oops. So so these. Um, these electrodes here, they are pristine and infinite to infinity. So it's important that there's, so if, if it's pristine to infinity, there, then it must also couple to something that looks a, a little bit like it. And that's uh, purely electrostatics. If you're trying to put in something that doesn't match the electrostatics, you have changed the boundary conditions of your system and you will effectively simulate a different system that you, than uh, what you intended. There's some special care you need to be uh, careful about is uh, you have to do a contour that uh, needs to encapsulate a lowest lying state. That's, uh, I would say the defaults are pretty uh, sufficient, but if you have uh, semi-core states, then you might be uh, be really, um, you have to adapt to your, to your system in that case. SCF convergence is uh, typically more difficult for transistor. Typically you need a lower mixing weight but again, if you are obeying your metallic electrodes and really a good screen uh, of your defect towards your electrode regions, SCF convergence is not too difficult. Transistor calculations is also heavy in the sense that you need to do one calculation per bias point. So you calculate for zero bias and then you calculate for the next bias point and so on and so forth. So it's, it's also a, a much longer process in, in, with that respect. So it's also uh, another thing that you need to do is that transistor only calculates the non-equilibrium density for any given uh, bias point. And then subsequently, you have to post-process that data to calculate the transmission function and uh, current and orbital transmission and stuff like that. And you need to do that also for every bias point. So there's, there's a bigger overhead here in, in terms of computations. Uh, TB trans also, uh, which is the type binding transmissions uh, transmission function, which calculates all of these things, also requires a much bigger k-point sampling. And this is also related to the density of states of a system. If you, the SCF cycle typically doesn't require a, a very dense k-point grid, but if you want a very precise projected density of states or just density of states, you generally want a much denser k-point. Grid. And it's the same case for TB trains for transmissions functions. Uh, you need a much, much higher uh, grid of uh, K points. So you also need to converge that after you have done your, your zero bias calculation. So uh, I've pinpointed here that uh, these two points here, bulk and electro regions, that's very hard. Uh, we have had uh, tutorials for a couple of years now, and I can see that this is, this is where the students are struggling the most. Uh, so if you are starting to do a transistor calculation, don't expect things to go smooth. Really try to understand these two points and uh, try to view it from a, uh, an electrostatic view. Um, that will greatly benefit you when you try to understand what's really happening in the SCF cycle and what transistor is doing. 
So here's uh, some tutorials you can find. There's also a tutorial on the website that you have been linked in your uh, uh, in this workshop. So there's there's plenty of material to to get in depth here. Uh, okay, I will skip a little bit fast across this. So the grief function method is limited by uh, this inversion of this matrix, and uh, there's ways of, of doing that uh, much faster, and that's why it's, it scales to, to many thousands of atoms, because it doesn't really invert the full matrix. So that's basically it. Um, also not important. Let's, let's just move on. Another thing that's really important for non-equilibrium Green's functions or transistor in part is that you can do DFT calculations by removing periodic boundary conditions. When you attach an electrode to a system, you are effectively putting in an infinite prestige system as the boundary condition. So you are removing the periodic boundary conditions for your system. In Siesta, what you are doing, uh, for instance, in this case, you have some pristine system and in the red region, you have some defect. If you're doing a siesta calculation, you have periodic boundary conditions, which means that the defect sees its own mirror on the neighboring sides. And uh, effectively, what you want to do is increase your system to such a large extent that the um, defects doesn't feel the interference from the neighboring defects. And that can be quite difficult if the defect is big and the system then grows uh, to a very, very large size. So. For uh, transistor calculations, what you're doing is you're putting two electrodes in this one, and then you are removing the boundary conditions along the uh, along the transport direction here, right? So you are still limited to having a periodic boundary condition transverse to the to the electrodes. So you haven't removed everything from a pure uh, transistor calculation in this case. So Tuzen has uh, made a paper about this where it's important to increase the width of your system until you've also converged your, your uh, parameters in, in that calculation. So another thing that is enabled in Transiesta is that you can now completely remove this image coupling by having a self energy that surrounds the entire defect. So you have, in this case, you only have one electrode and then you are calculating then uh, a single defect. There's no image uh, connection between this defect and something else. Uh, there's so this is just a requirement of this uh, periodic um, or removal of the periodic boundary conditions. The the implications of the self energies is that you have to have screened off the defect as good as possible towards the electrodes, and this is what is signaled through this V. So the V needs to be equivalent if it's a purely bulk thing, and it needs to so that's the coupling matrix, right? So here you have the same V that couples from an infinite system into your defect regions. So this turns also to be a very hard problem to solve because you need to, cal to calculate the self energies around this. You need to do it for the system that's, that's this big and that, that's really heavy. So there are ways to go around this problem and we've tried to solve this and it can do pretty big systems. Um, and it can at least be uh, informative of what's really happening for, for a true defect. So here's a case study. We have a nitrogen defect in graphene. And uh, what you see in an experiment is you only have one nitrogen defect, right? There's, there's no other nitrogens in a neighboring field or it's not located in a periodic array. So if you do a density functional theory, uh, calculation with a nitrogen defect in a graphene system. So in this case, a nine by nine system, 162 atoms. Uh, this is then the band structure of graphene with the projection onto the nitrogen defect. And as you can see here, you this will result in a two peak structure in the density of states. You have some density of states here on the nitrogen and some density of states here on the nitrogen. Uh, while the physics is, is typically very good, you can see here the physics of the STM image is pretty resembling of this one. So it's capturing the large effects to, to, a, to a good extent. But in reality, this would probably not happen. So here's a comparison of, of doing that same calculation in three different ways. One is basically the same one as uh, the paper was doing it. So you have uh, periodic boundary conditions along all directions. Then we uh, use two electrodes 
So one here down and the one on the top uh, edge here. So then you have only neighboring along the uh, transverse directions. And then also finally a self entity surrounding the full system. So there you will completely remove the image connections. And here you see that the red one, which is the single electrode where you have totally uncoupled the periodic images, you have uh, a single peak. And this is also what you would expect. You can do that for a, a very large scale type binding calculations and you will see that you will only get one peak. You can see now that I have three peaks in my siesta calculation, and that's because of the way I've designed this system. This is a square cell, so you have different lengths along this direction and this direction, and this is what's causing a three-peak structure, contrary to the, the previous one where it's only a two-peak uh, structure. That depends on how you define the system. So that's another way to see that you really have a big uh, interference pattern between different images. Uh, you see something different happening depending on the uh, the choice of your simulation side. I think I will quickly skip this one. Uh, this is just to say you can do STM calculations with a single electrode, and it also tends to be very uh, important when you're doing bond transmissions because then you get a, a completely perfect or completely symmetric uh, bond current. Um, yeah, it can also be used for surface states. So I will not go into that. And I think here I will finish with the last slide, just a small uh, teaser for the Lua scripting interface. So Siesta can uh, be controlled or monitored through a Lua scripting language. And this is more of a prototyping uh, way of interacting with Siesta. So you can change mixing parameters on the fly. Uh, you can implement some algorithms that changes the mixing weight depending on whether your uh, change in the matrices are very big, so you can decrease your mixing parameters and you can sort of build up a, a more versatile way of, of doing uh, SCF cycles. And you can actually improve the SCF cycle time by, by doing this because generally if you want a very low mixing weight in the start of the SCF loop and when you're close to convergence, you typically can increase your mixing weight to get faster convergence. And this can be done in this uh, Lua interface. Um, then you can also, it's very easy to do a prototype MD algorithm in, in, uh, in Lua. You don't have to compile CSD again and again. You just write, uh, like in Python, you change something and then you can, you can basically uh, do it. And it can also be useful for monitoring quantities on the fly if you, if you are interested in that. There's some tutorial, uh, in the Siesta sources, there's some tests. You can look into those. Or there's also a tutorial uh, on the site that you have been shared. And there's also how to use the Lua scripting interface. And I think that's my time. Yes. OK, good. Good morning. And I'm going to be talking about um, uh, servers in Siesta, uh, a bit uh, the beginning in general terms. But then I will focus on a couple which are either accelerated, and it's uh, typical now in modern architectures, or even if they are not accelerated with the GPUs, they are so efficient that they allow extremely large calculations. You have been seeing that uh, Siesta is quite efficient because it uses a small basis set, a low cardinality basis set. Uh, but then you can really push it to, uh, to do extremely large systems when you are uh, running calculations in supercomputers. OK, this will become clear later, I hope. So the basic theory you know already, uh, the basic category of uh, uh, Siesta is that it uses a localized basis set um, of pseudo-atomic orbitals. So you expand the wave function in, in that, and you get a set of coefficients, which you can obtain by uh, standard algebraic methods, by what we call the generalized eigenvalue problem. It's generalized because there is overlap between the basis elements, the overlap matrix. So by diagonalizing, you can get the coefficients, and then you can construct other things like the density matrix, or you can obtain the, the charge density and other magnitudes in siesta. So the coefficients of the wave functions and, and the density matrix are the basic objects representing the electronic structure. Now, the first category of solvers 
just because of uh, this obvious algebraic uh, development is is based on diagonalization and for that you can just take off the shelf libraries the typical one is lapac or in parallel scalapac in which there are a number of uh, routines ranging in usability from uh, very basic with few parameters to expert modes in which you can uh, determine and um, select many options. So we have a bunch of them in, in Siesta and they are quite good. You can get very far with them. Then there are other specialized libraries which also are based on diagonalization, but they take uh, specific, they, they do specific tricks or they use a specific algorithms to get more efficiency. For example, ELPA uses a sequence of transformations in the matrix that uh, lead to shorter um, CPU times and better scalability. Typically, what you do with the matrix is uh, not try to diagonalize it directly, as with, for example, the classic Jacobi method. You convert it to a form which is easier to handle. And the typical form to to target is the tri-diagonal uh, structure in which you have a diagonal and then just two uh, upper and lower diagonals uh, in, and the rest is R zeros. So that's very easy to diagonalize, or much easier than the, than the starting matrix. So once you have the matrix in that form, the algorithm is quite straightforward and fast. So you need to get there and the way you get there is what the differentiates different algorithms. So ELPA uses the standard uh, triagonalizer, but then to get the, to the diagonal, it uses a different method. Either way, you find that with uh, diagonalization, the the time, the computational time scales uh, with the third power is cubic scaling, and then the memory scales quadratically with the size of the matrix. Siesta is still competitive because the basis set is low cardinality. You have typically much fewer basis elements in your system than typical plane wave calculations, for example. But then there is another method of obtaining the density matrix. The density matrix is this combination of um, uh, uh, expansion coefficients, basically an internal pro an outer product of the of the vector of coefficients. And you can get it directly from the Hamiltonian through a symbolic operation. Basically, the density matrix can be seen as the application of the Fermi Dirac function that tells you which states are occupied and which are empty, application of that function on the Hamiltonian. And you might say, well, how do you do that? It's not easy to, to get that. Uh, function applied to a matrix. So what you do is you expand that function into a simpler form, typically in polynomials. So that, that's called the Fermi operator expansion. And then your matrix operations are simply products with your Hamiltonian. That's the basis of uh, a large family of methods, which uh, in Siesta are embodied in the chess library, which originally came from the big DFT project. And with the Features of the basis set in Siesta, of localized basis sets, is linear scaling. This is one of the linear scaling solvers that are available in Siesta. I won't go into those in this talk, but I'll just remind you that there is that are there. And this, the linear scaling comes from the sparsity of the of the data structures used. Now, this thing is efficient, but it could be uh, more efficient still. In, in practice, the number of terms in the expansion limits the, the performance, and that uh, number of terms increases with the, with the size of the spectrum of the matrix. So if you have a relatively large spectrum, you might need more um, um, polynomial elements, and then your performance will suffer. So, Within Siesta, and that's another another project, we're exploring uh, basis contraction to get even better performance in this set. But then there is another way of expanding the Fermi function, which is based 
on not on a polynomial series, but on a inverse negative uh, powers, so to speak, or what is called the Laurent uh, series. And then your density matrix is just a sum over poles, they're called, of this combination of the Hamiltonian and overlap matrices. And then you might think that this is crazy because inversion is an operation which is also cubic scaling. Now, but you don't need all the elements on the inverse matrix because you are targeting the density matrix, which is a sparse object, or rather, you don't need all the elements of the density matrix, you just need those elements that connect orbitals. And since the orbitals are uh, limited range, then the number of those elements that you need is relatively small. So the scaling of this method, regardless of the appearance, is quite, quite good. For quasi one dimensional systems, it could be linear scaling. And the most is uh, quadratic scaling for, for dense systems. All this comes from the sparsity of the of what the of the part of the density matrix that you need to compute other things in CST. And then since you have an expansion over poles, the work on each pole is independent of the others and is trivially parallelizable. So this method is quite good for extreme scalability and massively parallel calculation. Now, how do you handle all these uh, possibilities of uh, solver uh, methods and tricks? One initiative called LC aims at uh, simplifying that by providing two things. First, a collection of solvers, which are prepackaged libraries or built-in versions of them. And then a layer of interface in which you with which you deal with, uh, you just send it your initial ingredients, in this case the Hamiltonian and the overlap matrix, and you get back what you want. You might want wave functions or you might want directly the density matrix. So that simplifies things because you don't need to care about the format in which specific solvers want their matrices in. You just send it to the LC layer and then you get back things from the LC layer. And this project has been quite successful. It's a collaboration between Duke and, and Berkeley. And in Siesta, we have an interface to it. So all you need is an interface to this LC layer. And then if the LC layer, if the LC project adds new solvers or adds new features, you get them automatically. For example, when we started, there was no anti-poly interface, but uh, then they implemented as a backend anti-poly with uh, density matrix purification algorithms, and then automatically, just with a couple of lines extra in CS, that we get that functionality. So this is a, an example of a, a very powerful software development paradigm, which is the separation of concerns. You know that there are experts in things, for example, in libraries for linear algebra, or as we'll see later, in GPU acceleration, and you want some, you have some specific needs. You abstract your needs into an interface and let the, the experts deal with the back end and you deal with your logic and your science. So this is the strategy you have been followed in Siesta for not just for the collection of servers, but for the individual tasks of uh, uh, keeping track of the landscape of the new architectures in machines. The, the latest big development are, as you know, GPUs. And most new supercomputers are being commissioned now with a large fraction of their power based on GPUs. So how do we go about using, using them efficiently in Siesta? In Siesta, uh, the basic idea is that the, the solver stage is what takes most of the CPU time. There are other operations in Siesta, but they are quite efficient because of the localized nature of the orbitals. And so they are linear scaling and they don't take that much time in a typical calculation. So one thing, the solver takes up most of the time. And then if we focus on the solver for acceleration or whatever, we might get most of the performance increases that we need. And in fact, that's what we need, what we did. Um, in the past few years, we have been using a GPU accelerated versions of ELPA, which is also part of LC, to get uh, speed ups of the order of four times or five times in the solver step, which is, as I said, 
most of the CPU time involved in, in the operation of CST. These are some plots that were obtained in, a, in the predecessor of Leonardo, which was called Marconi 100. It was a similar machine with uh, previous generation of GPUs. And uh, the figures there show the different stages of the diagonalization with ELPA. There is first the Cholesky step for converting the generalized eigenvalue problem into a normal eigenvalue problem. And that at that time was not accelerated. You see that the size of the dark green piece is still the same. And then there are other parts like the solving stage for the tridiagonal problem, which is accelerated. And in fact, you can get up to seven or eight speed up factor there and other operations. So then on the on the lower right, you see an approximate picture of the kind of acceleration that you get. Look at the logarithm, logarithmic scale. So you get typically four or five times speed up. Now in, in Leonardo, this trend has continued, of course. But uh, as I said earlier, if you are if you have an interface to a library, you get all the improvements that are done in that library. And in particular, uh, in ELPA, they keep working, and they have um, produced now a version of the GPU of loading of the Cholesky step, which is quite interesting. They have also uh, accelerated a, a different flavor of the ELPA algorithm, and they are also providing backends for uh, GPUs beyond NVIDIA, that is uh, AMD and the new Intel GPUs. So by providing an interface to ELPA, we get uh, acceleration and good performance in a range of machines. There are still things that need to be dealt with. In the previous transparency, I didn't mention it because now in Leonardo, it's not that uh, important, but uh, typically you need to know well your machine to do proper mapping of uh, your CPUs to GPUs, depending on the specific architectural issues. Or as I comment in the first lines in this transparency, you might want to, to know how many uh, MPI processes to match to its GPU. And you will see in the hands-on tutorial that uh, sometimes more is not better. If you try to oversubscribe the, the GPUs with MPI ranks, you might not get good performance just because your communications are uh, overwhelming the actual computation. So um, that's uh, this picture on the right. This is something similar to what you will get uh, even if it's for a larger system. Uh, that uh, the number of MPI tasks for a particular GPU as a sweet spot. And we are collaborating now with the Chineca staff to use uh, what's called the MPS framework from NVIDIA to try to um, match better the MPI, to stream the MPI uh, communications into the GPUs. Now, uh, the PEXI solver, we, we mentioned that uh, it has uh, good scalability. The good scalability comes because it has three levels of parallelization. You can do the operations in the in the selected in the um, a selected inversion algorithm parallelized over orbitals, as typical. Then you all obviously get the parallelization over poles, and then in the version of PEXI, which is shipped with the LC interface, you get an extra level, which is um, the, the calculations you need to know to determine the Fermi level. Let me see if I can get you the picture again. In that uh, Fermi function, there is a parameter, which is the Fermi level, that obviously determines the boundary of the occupied and the unoccupied states. So you need to determine that at the same time. And the way in which uh, it's done in, in the modern PEXI is that you do uh, independent calculations for different values of the chemical potential. You can do them in parallel, independent of one another, and then you interpolate. You, you see which uh, value will give you the right number of electrons. So you have these three level parallelization hierarchy, which allows you to use many thousands of processes. 
It also has a reduced memory footprint because you deal with the sparse matrices. You don't need to convert them to dense form as with the, the Scala pack based or ELPA based algorithms. In this picture on the upper right, you see diagonalization. It's not only that it takes a lot of time, but it starts to be possible only for quite a high number of processes just because of the memory needs. With PEXI, you can go much uh, further to the left with a few uh, processes, MPI processes. Those things, I won't go into detail, but are um, scalability plots for different kinds of systems, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, dense, etc. Um, in PEXI, there is an extra trick, which is uh, an estimation of the chemical potential with what is called inertia counting. I just mentioned it because if you go into the into the LC papers, you might see it mentioned. This is an a way to estimate the approximate uh, density of states by just doing linear algebra uh, operations on a shifted Hamiltonian. It's relatively cheap and can give you um, an outline of the density of states that can serve for a first approximation to the chemical potency. Now, this is a, a very interesting transparency. Uh, it's just a comparison of the different methods for a large problem. This is um, a virus uh, surrounded by water molecules. In this particular version, it has approximately 9,000 atoms and approximately 60,000 orbitals. That's a big system. And other codes will have a lot of trouble dealing with this. And with Siesta, we, we will see uh, the number of nodes in the lower left plot, you see that we can start at two nodes, two nodes in Marconi, two nodes in Leonardo, approximately. That's a very small hardware requirement to run big systems. Of course, the question is, if you increase the number of nodes, can you get better performance? Can you reduce the time to solution? So in fact, if you look at the, the lower left figure, you see that the, with diagonalization, which are the the purple and the dark green lines. First, you, you do get you do get uh, acceleration by using GPUs. You get some scalability, but you already see that the GPU version is sort of losing performance when you increase the number of nodes. That's because you are not using the GPUs to the full. There are there is not enough data for them to churn. But if you look at the other lines, the PEXI lines, you see that you have a large reserve of scalability. You can go to much higher number of nodes and to reduce the time to solution accordingly. And on the plot on the right, the information is basically the same, but presented in a way in which makes it easier to, to grasp the scalability. Is the cost in terms of node times hours spent? That will be what they deduct from your allocation when you run a system. And then that is, that is compared to the time to solution. Look at the green line at the bottom. You see that uh, it moves out quite quickly. The, the slope of that line is the marginal cost of getting uh, better time to solution. If it's flat, it's, it's good because you, you get uh, a better time to solution with uh, similar cost just by increasing the number of, of nodes. But if you try to get better time to solution with uh, diagonalization with CPUs or with GPUs, the slope is much higher. So the PEXI has better scalability because it's flatter and the, the diagonalization methods have a larger marginal cost. So you, you can get better time to solution, but it really doesn't pay off. You are better off stopping at some point and running alternative calculations that you might need. You might need to scan other parameters like uh, composition or pressures or whatever. You're better off doing that. I see many times uh, scalability plots in which they go up to 2,000 cores and you see that already at 400, they are getting less than 50% efficiency. And that probably is not good enough to justify the expense. There are other solvers in Siesta, but I don't go. I, I will not go into much details. Just mention that um, there are native interfaces to PEXI and ELPA, 
in Siesta. In fact, the PEX interface was the first uh, uh, mainstream interface to the, the method. But that used a different algorithm. And we are probably going to, to make it a bit more modern, uh, updating the interface to the new version. And there is also a native interface to help that, that also needs to be updated to exploit the latest features. So now for the practical exercises, I have prepared uh, first a special version of Siesta because the one you're using up to now, which is version 5.0, or rather the, well, it's the beta version, but it's really 5.0. That version has a lot of new features, but does not have yet the LC interface. The LC interface was in development and we have been uh, stress testing it and only recently we have merged it into the mainstream development of Siesta. So this is the what we call the master version, the master branch, and that's what I have compiled for you. I have compiled it in with SPAC environment, uh, which is quite powerful. It will be interesting to discuss that, but we don't have time. The, the bottom line is that uh, you need to use a different incantation to set up the system, but you don't worry, you should not worry because it's fully automatic. I have prepared Slurm scripts in which the, the setup is included. In fact, this uh, hands-on tutorial is a bit different from the previous ones because it uh, concentrates on actual low-level things like number of nodes or number of tasks rather than in the physics of things. So, for example, this is the Slurm script in which I have highlighted the things that are relevant for checks of scalability, etc. So, you should be looking at the number of nodes, the number of tasks per node. Then the incantation is uh, in blue, uh, in near the center. It's just loading a special module that I have prepared in which the path to Siesta is explicitly set and with other things that you might need. And then the, the, the command to run the program in parallel. So what you typically do, once you copy, as you have done, once you copy the relevant directory of exercises to your account, you just go into a specific section of the tutorial. I have two, LC Elpa and LC Pexi. Go into a particular directory. There are readme files there about what you can do. And then as batch, a submit job file. You wait just a, a few minutes. Typically, the even though it's a big system, the sizes are small. The size of the system is approximately 26,000 orbitals. That's a minimal basis set for a system of approximately 12,000 atoms. This is big by other code standards, but still manageable. In fact, you can do these calculations in a single node of Leonardo. So once you have obtained results in a few minutes, you can compile the timing results by using a special script. Actually, um, I, I realize now that I have forgotten to change the name to analyze.sh. I think it's called proc.sh in the in the exercises in the in the directories. Yes. So basically, it gathers the. The data presents this in this particular form, in which, for example, for ELPA, you see the timings of the different sections of the algorithm. The Cholesky step and the triadagonalization, the solving, etc. Um, there are GPU and CPU versions. Let me show you. Ah, okay. This is about the only thing that you should care about in the FDF file to run uh, uh, the LC Elpa interface to diagonalization. You specify instead of solution method diagon, as it has been typical in the previous exercises, you say LC. And then within LC, you say that the solver you want is Elpa, because it has several, right. of course. A particular flavor is number two. And then you want GPUs. You might not want it just to check what speed up you get, and there is an exercise for that. One or zero is the setting. And then uh, special cosmetic things like the output level and the use of a particularly good timer to get things hierarchically presented, etc. Now, another feature is the number of eigenstates that you want. You typically, if you have a, an insulator or a molecule or uh, something which is not a metal, you just want the number of 
occupied states, but in some cases you may need more, of usually for metals, and when you're doing smearing. So this is a trick to use a negative number to specify how many um, states over the Fermi level do you want to consider. You don't need to do the accounting of the number of electrons. But if you do want to get, select a specific number of vacant states, you use a typical positive number, like in the example at the bottom. So the structure of the ELPA hands-on is like this. There are two directories, CPU and GPU. The CPU is just one, um, one case. You can obviously edit the files, but uh, you can get quite far by selecting a few to run. I suggest that in order not to get too long, you run maybe the CPU and the, the GPU, a couple, maybe a couple of GPU examples. I don't know how much, how many nodes we have reserved. This will reserve, this will run in two nodes, except the GPU one node case, which runs in one node. Um, okay, so I'll just comment one more thing and I'll let you work on this section. Look at the files in the directory. There is the FDF file with a few keywords, and then there is a coordinates file. Obviously, that you need a big file with coordinates for 12,000 atoms, so it's a separate file. And the submit job file, which is this. But there is no pseudo-potential file. Where are the pseudo-potentials? Well, the pseudo-potentials are specified in this uh, next to last line, maybe you know about this trick already, I haven't checked. You can put your pseudo potentials in a centrally place, uh, in a central location, and then you can set this environmental variable to tell Siesta where to look for them. This is quite handy. Okay, so now you are off to running the, the ELPA part of the tutorial. I don't know how much uh, time we can give you, maybe 15 minutes or organizers, what do you think? Yeah, we can do 15 minutes for the exercise. Okay, if I you can, get more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can say that we have reserved enough um, node hours for this workshop, so we can run this exercise. Okay, you, then maybe you can submit things at the same time. Mm -hmm so that you don't need to, to wait too long. Okay, so I let you work and I'll monitor the questions. Okay, so for the PEXI solver, remember that this is based on a pole expansion. The density matrix is obtained directly uh, by a combination of selected inversion and adding the contribution of several poles. So here in the FDF flags, you see information about all those things. First, the solution method is again LC, because this is the PEXI version that is built in, shipped with LC. Uh, LC solver PEXI. Now, the method, the PEXI method uh, refers to the way in which the poles are obtained. There are several algorithms you need to fit well, the Fermi Dirac function, and you need you need to do it ideally with the smallest number of poles possible. So this uh, number three method, which is uh, the, the the acronym is AAA for the initials of the authors, typically works well with as few as twenty poles. So here we select the method number three, and number of poles will be twenty. A very important computational uh, parameter is how many tasks um, are going to deal with the information in one pole, that is the inversion of this combination of H and S. In this particular example, it is four. That means that uh, if we have 32 CPUs in a node, there can be eight teams doing poles independently. The next parameter is the number of new points. This is, as I said, is a way of uh, interpolating the information about the number of electrons correlated with the Fermi level. In this case, it's just two. That used to work uh, quite well. Uh, you might increase it, but typically two is, is good enough. So with these two, 
the scalability is um, based on the number of poles, which is 20, and the number of uh, independent chemical potentials used, which is two. So it's 40. You are dealing with 40 poles, and ideally, you could be doing them all in parallel. Since you have eight teams in each node, and you need to be working on 40, you just need five nodes to do this whole calculation fully parallel way. Then the next parameters are the initial bracketing of the Fermi level. This is very wide, but uh, after doing the inertia counting step, it will narrow it down. Um, we are only running um, one SCF step, by the way. We are not completely doing a, a geometry optimization or anything like that, just to exhibit the solver. And then another parameter at the bottom is the normalization tolerance. That uh, since you, the number of electrons is actually a product of where you put the Fermi level, in some systems, it could be slightly off. And Siesta will complain if it's slightly off, even if later renormalizes your density metric. So this might be useful to avoid the warning from Siesta or stop. Now, what you have in the LCPEX directory are four cases in which you use different tasks per pole, from ranging from four, in which you have these eight teams in each node, to 32, in which the whole set of CPU cores in a node is working on a, on a single pole. In that case, you need 40 um, nodes to run this in, in parallel. I don't know if you will have enough uh, allocation for that, or it might take longer to, to run in the queue. So you might concentrate on TPP4 and TPP8 if you want to run fully parallel cases of the of this system. The system is the same as the previous one with, uh, with ELPA. Another thing that you can do if you uh, if you find that you don't get the number of poles that would be ideal to get everything in parallel, is you can select fewer nodes and then the poles will be processed in batches. For example, if you specify uh, that you want only one node in this TPP4, sorry, in TTP8, TTP8 means that uh, eight cores work on a, on a pole. So you have four teams of eight cores in, in one node. Since you have 40 poles, actually 40 poles points because of the new uh, parallelizability, then you need to be uh, running things, running with this uh, team 10 times to process all the, the poles. You can fit things in one node, but it will take 10 times longer. This is because the Parallelizability of the poles is, is trivial. So if you run these couple of examples, you will see um, the scalability, and you might, with more time later at home or whatever, uh, look at the output file to see what it's doing, how it's updating the chemical potential until it converges. We won't have time to go into that. Okay, so you have maybe another 15 minutes, slightly less. Then I will just want to go back to the, the take home message about the, the talk. Okay, I'm going to just say a few words at the end. I would like to recap the features of these solvers we have been discussing. <clears throat> The diagonalization with GPU acceleration is go quite good, but it can get you only so far in regards to scalability. It, uh, unless your system is extremely large, when you start to, to use a, a few, few dozens of GPUs, you'll see that they are not being used efficiently. So your scalability suffers. Whereas PEXI, which actually is not GPU accelerated has a large reserve of scalability and can get you things done with uh, lots of processes if you want to have a small 
I'm too short to share. Uh, uh, it pays to study this this graph because it has interesting features. Then in, in the tutorial, we have not explored other things that might be worth exploring. For example, in ELPA, you see that I focus on the MPI rank to GPU number ratio, but there are, wait, what happened? Uh, there are other things. For example, you can explore what happens when you change the block size for distribution of the orbitals. The matrices. There are a couple of examples. One is BS40, which is not a power of two, and another is one BS32. If you have done those, you will see that BS40 is some, somehow non-optimal. So there are things that you can change inside the algorithm um, that might have may affect performance. There is also the issue of the distribution of the number of nodes in the rectangular. MPI grid that ELPA uses. If you have a very long grid, let's say you have 13, <laughs> for some reason you only have 13 MPI ranks, which is a prime number, you need to use a one by 13 grid. And that's really bad for performance. You need to use more or less a square grid in the MPI distribution. In, in, in other words, there are many things that you should consider. And I think that the next frontier in HPC is to advise users on how to use the resources efficiently. For a given problem, should I use PEXI, should I use GPUs? How many GPUs uh, MPI ranks ratio? Should I use OpenMP? Uh, should I use a block size of X? Uh, this would be really a recommended system for these kinds of problems. Um, I don't have the complete answer, but I think this is the next thing to try. It's like a execution compiler or something like that. Okay, and with this, if there are no more questions, I think it's time to, to finish, right? <laughs>